Now, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you obviously through the whiskies that you have hopefully received through the post. Um, I'm also going to throw a little presentation onto the screen. I generally hate death by PowerPoint because it's awful. I hate it. Um, I much prefer to you know, see you in person and be able to describe things with my hands and my voice and all that kind of thing. But because of the uh, the new media, the new times that we find ourselves in, it's actually quite useful to have something so that you're not just looking at a beardy man, uh, which I completely understand is not is not that desirable all the time. Um, so I'm gonna th I'm gonna throw something on there. Um, let's just get that on. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay. Good. Thumbs up. Great. Okay. So, um, just very briefly, this is us, the Whiskey Lounge. That's me some years ago on the back of a boat sailing around the Isle of Isla. Um, the Whiskey Lounge was started by myself and then uh, my wife. Um, as a way of expressing our love for whiskey, you know, we we absolutely, you know, we love whiskey, and it's 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 our it's our thing, um, and that's the reason we do it. We want people to to enjoy whiskey in the same way that we do, and to that end, we created the whiskey lounge as a way of bringing whiskey out into the wider populace. Where certainly when we started the the business, whiskey was very much either Scotland centric or London centric and it was slightly frustrating to us so we decided to take it all around the UK so doing festivals and tastings in the slightly less um, likely places like Newcastle and Manchester and um, Sheffield, Leeds, um, Bristol and so on um, and we've been doing this successfully for over 10 years now obviously what we're doing now is completely different. You know, we're used to seeing tens of thousands of people every year at our events and suddenly, you know, you're not doing that anymore, um, which is fair enough. You know, we're all having to make adjustments, but um, ours has been quite dramatic in terms of our business. So we're now completely online um, with tasting packs and these accompanying virtual tastings. Uh, hopefully uh, we will get back to what we, what we do best um, but for, in the meantime, this is a this is an adequate substitute, I think. They work tend to work quite well. Um, let's go on to the next slide. What I want to do first of all is get you drinking. I've seen far too many of these presentations where you get half an hour of chat before you even get a drink, and that's uh, that's not what I'm about. So we're going to start with the first whiskey, if you don't mind. I've got a slightly bigger bottle than you, but don't worry, I'll, I'll keep myself uh, to a reasonable measure. Uh, so you should have this Ockentoshan American Oak. Now, the, before we go into any detail in terms of uh, production and all that kind of thing, um, I just want to get you into the, into the kind of swing of, of how I approach uh, whiskey in terms of analytical tasting. Um, you pr possibly have one of these or maybe a few more of these or perhaps you don't. It, 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 these are Glencairn whiskey tasting glasses. They're very, very good for what we're going to be doing this evening, which is drilling down into the DNA, the flavor um, and aromas. If you don't, don't worry, it's fine. Wine glasses work really well. So I've got one here actually preloaded, admittedly with wine. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I drink wine as well, I'm afraid. Um, but our aim here is to really just get as much flavor information from the whiskey, okay? And we do that by hook or by crook with whatever glassware we've got, okay? Um, when I'm at home, as I am now, but it's later at night and I'm just enjoying a whiskey, I'll tend to reach for a heavy tumbler because um, I like the feel of it in my hand. And you can fit more whiskey in it, frankly. Um, but anyway, for this purposes, these are great. Um, so let's have a wee look at the, the color of it. Uh, I don't have a white sheet here, but 
just a tip whenever you're doing any kind of whiskey or wine tasting, hold a A4 white sheet of paper behind it will give you the truest color. Um, I can tell you this is where you can probably see it. it's, it's a whiskey color, uh, otherwise known as I would say pale gold if we were being pushed. Now in terms of what we do next, we smell it, we nose the whiskey. And what I tend to, to recommend is because this is the first whiskey of the evening for most of you, it is for me surprisingly enough, is hold it a few inches below your nose to begin with and just sniff gently. You'll start to get some of the aromas. And then as you become more accustomed to it, get your nose closer to the glass. Finally, the resting place for me is the nose right in the glass. And just breathing it in gently. You don't need to do any short, sharp sniffs or you know anything that's going to make you uncomfortable because whiskey is a very strong set of flavors. You know, a lot of people uh, express their dislike for whiskey mainly because it's a it's a tight ball of flavor which is wrapped up in very strong alcohol, and it's fully understandable why people don't get it. It really, it's, it's completely, I'm completely sympathetic. Uh, I didn't get whiskey until I was in my mid twenties. Uh, so it took, it took a long time for me to get it. Um, now this whiskey is what I would describe as a breakfast whiskey. Okay. Uh, it's not necessarily you would pour it on your cornflakes, although it's been known, uh, but it's something that you would start your evening with an aperitif as the as the french would say you know it's something easy going some very nice sweet fruity floral soft which is going to just tickle the taste buds and get you prepared for the rest of the evening um now have you got a, a little jug of water or something a receptacle with some water in it if not i would recommend you 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 at some point maybe maybe grab one um because again I don't always add water to whiskey if I'm just at home of an evening drinking whiskey. But if I really want to get to grips with what's going on inside the whiskey, as much flavor information as possible, water is your friend. Now, what I would suggest is that you taste the whiskey without water to begin with. Okay. Part of the reason for this is that when you do add water, it does remove some of the kind of um, intensity of flavor, the, 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 not necessarily the burn, if you like, but it, it removes some of the, 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 the intensity. Um, so it's quite nice to experience it at full strength first. The Ockentoshan we're just about to taste is 40%. So it's, it's at the, 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 the base level of, of um, what whiskey can be bottled at, if you like. Um, we don't have anything too strong this evening. So, you know, we're, 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 we're breaking you in nice and gently, I hope. So anyway, let's give it a taste. And when we taste it, just keep it in your mouth for a few seconds um, and then swallow it down. Try and keep a little bit in the glass so we can add a bit of water to it. So the kind of flavors I would be looking out for in, a, in an Ockentoshan of this type, matured in American oak, would be quite vanilla driven, slightly spicy, um, coconut, um, maybe a bit of toffee caramel characteristics, which are all associated with um, Scotch whiskies that have been matured in what we call ex-bourbon white American oak casks, okay? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. So I'm gonna add quite a bit of water. I mean, when I'm doing whiskey judging, we tend to add at least 50% water to 50% whiskey, uh, because the more water you add, the more flavor information you can extract. Um, but hopefully you'll see just add a few drops to begin with you can always add a little bit more if you want to but just remember once you've added water into it you can't take it out that's 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 the big that's the big issue here then when you smell it again what you should find and what certainly what i find 
is that it stripped back some of the more um, oak derived flavors. So the, the vanilla, the coconut and so on. And it's stripped it back to reveal the really lovely, light and delicate floral, fruity flavors, which come from the distillate character. So from when the whiskey was actually distilled rather than from when it was matured. So what you're kind of looking for really with the addition of water is a, is a healthy balance between the oak derived flavors and the distillate derived flavors, yeah? So we'll give that a taste now, that lower strength. Hmm. So now I just get a lovely mouthful of ripe fruit, you know, green fruit, some melon, banana. It's just a very, very, do you, do you all see that? Have you tried that? Yeah. Again, what I would emphasize here is that add whiskey, to, add, add water to the whiskey if you want to. You know, it's not mandatory. Uh, I would never tell anyone how to drink their whiskey. Um, these days, I drink a lot of cocktails that I make myself in the house, mainly um, the classics like Old Fashions and Manhattans and things like that. So I'm, I'm nobody to tell you, you know, how to drink your whiskey. A few years ago, I might have said, I might have been more militant about it. But nowadays, you know, you do what you like with it. It's your whiskey, it's your money. So you do what you like, what makes you feel most comfortable. When you, the other benefit to adding water to the whiskey is obviously you're reducing the alcohol as well. So those people that have perhaps a slightly more sensitive palate um, will find it easier for their for their senses to actually uh, get to grips with it without having that really full on alcohol burn. So it does have a lot of advantages, the adding of water to the whiskey. Okay, so just gonna, as we're enjoying that Ockentosh and take you on a very brief um, trip around Scotland here. So all of the whiskies we're gonna be tasting tonight are Scottish whiskies. Um, now it's true to say that whiskey in all likelihood came from uh from ireland in the in the 12th or 13th century before entering into scotland through isla campbelltown and the lowlands uh, and then before then spreading into the highlands um, but whiskey really as we know it has only really existed for about 150 years you know prior to that it was a very different drink it probably was not matured in oak casks for three years or more. It would have been infused with uh, whatever was at hand, you know, local herbs and spices um, that, that could be foraged just to make it not taste like paint stripper. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, bear in mind what we're tasting here is, is what we would call, you know, modern whiskey. Um, so you can see the, the regions of Scotland broken up there. I wanted to show you that just so that you can see uh, how it all works regionally. But the regions of Scotland, is, again, is a fairly recent invention. You know, it's something that was, was, was uh, invented, if you like, in, in the 1990s as a way of trying to make the, 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 the you know, single malt whiskey particularly uh more comprehensible to, to to people that were buying it so it seemed like a good idea to pigeonhole whiskies into their regions what i can tell you now is that whilst it's quite a handy guide in certain ways uh it's not always that helpful when choosing whiskey because well, if you look at the highlands it's a huge area of, of land including all of the islands except isla and there are distilleries all over there including the islands producing very very different whiskies to each other and so to say something is a typical highland whiskey would be a really uh, well it would be a falsehood because there are so many different styles of highland whiskey um, but still it's important to understand you know what the regions are um, okay so we're going to be tasting whiskies from the lowlands, from the highlands, um, from Isla, and some from Speyside as well. So we're, we're covering most of the most of the regions there. 
Campbelltown is one region we're not going to be tasting from, unfortunately. Uh, I'd love to have a Campbelltown whiskey on here. Um, and generally speaking, if you see a single malt from Campbelltown, it's, it's going to be good. The three distilleries working there are all producing excellent stuff. Um, it's just there wasn't, there's not room for it on this evening's tasting, unfortunately. Okay, so there's some pretty pictures of Scotland for you. Just gratuitous pretty pictures um, from various regions. I mean, we all know Scotland is a beautiful place. Uh, it, it is, it is um, somewhere that I go several times a year, not just to the distilleries, but mainly to the distilleries. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful place, wonderful people. Now, where, where is Ockentosh? And you can see there it resides just literally outside the city limits of, of Glasgow. It is one of the older lowland distilleries still in operation. Um, the Lowlands itself has only recently started to welcome more and more distilleries. So it's, it's now blessed with um, quite a number of distilleries, whereas in previous years, it's only really had three, which would have been Glenkinchy, Ockentoshan and Bladnock. So those three distilleries have kind of been just working away, keeping the Lowland name going, if you like. Um, but now it's been joined by, you know, two others, um, well, two in central Glasgow and several others around, around the place as well. So it's, um, it's starting to become much more thriving than it was, which is great to see. By the way, if you want a copy of this presentation after the, after the tasting's finished, send me, a, send me an email um, to eddie at thewhiskeylounge.com and I'm more than happy to share it with you. Um, okay. Hope you're still drinking and enjoying that. Just a little bit of classroom stuff for you. Just important to understand, you know, what the definition of Scotch whiskey is. So it must be produced at a Scottish distillery from water, a mash of cereals and yeast only. It must be distilled to an alcohol volume less than 94.8%. That sounds like a big figure. That is a big figure. And that generally a is applying to what we call grain whiskey, which we're not going to be tasting this evening, but is contained in blended Scotch whiskey. And grain whiskey is made in a very different way to single malts. We're, we're, we're dealing here exclusively with, uh, with um, malt whiskey, which we're going to talk about the production of. But there is such a thing as grain whiskey. And grain whiskey is what allows the Scotch industry to really thrive because uh, without it, you simply wouldn't have uh the the johnny walkers the famous grouses the bells the shivers regals and so on most of those whiskies most of their dna is grain whiskey with malt whiskey added to it to to help kind of build the flavors um it must so that grain whiskey mustn't be um distilled to any more than 94.8 percent it's a slightly lower figure than if you were distilling grain spirit for for gin for example which must be a bit higher than that. Um, it must be matured in a Scottish warehouse and oak casks, not exceeding 700 litres for a minimum of three years. Um, that, that there really is, is what makes whiskey different from anything else, you know, from, from white spirits like vodka and gin and so on, is the minimum age, if you like. So three years in an oak cask, very important. It can't be any wooden cask. It must be oak. Uh, the reason for that, we will come to. Nothing other than water or spirit caramel or E150 may be added to the final product. E150 is simply um, sp uh, spirit caramel. It's, it's, it's basically burnt sugar in, in a very concentrated form. Um, I sometimes have it to demo. I have this little unattractive bottles of, of uh, brewer's caramel and you can literally just the tiniest of drops into a glass of water and it turns it into instant Macallan 18 year old it's incredible it, it, it's it's and but it has no flavor whatsoever um, a lot it's slightly controversial none of us like additives you know we're, we're, we're you know we're in this kind of society now where we everything has you know, we love provenance. We like to know where things come from and we like to know they haven't added things to it. 
E150 was brought about to create consistency in color. So <clears throat> whiskies like, you know, blended whiskies that are sold all around the world, big brands. If the whiskey in one year is slightly lighter than previous years, questions might be asked by those consumers, fussier consumers, and they might move to another brand. Simple as that. It's about creating consistency of color. Um, it doesn't tend to be added to more specialist single malts, although that's not to say it's not added to single malts because it is. Um, but in this country, it's not a requirement for it to be advertised on the label, unlike somewhere like Germany, where if it if that whiskey has been uh, or has had liquid caramel added to it, it must state it on the label. It would say mit caramel, whereas in this country we don't have that stipulation. So you you don't know unless unless you know. <laughs> um, it may be chill filtered. We'll talk about that when we come to the third whiskey and it must be bottled in Scotland, okay? And the minimum level of alcohol, as I've noted at the bottom, is 40% ABV, alcohol by volume. Now, just quickly running through the types of whiskey, Scotch whiskey. Number one, we've got single malt whiskey, which is what we're mainly talking about tonight. So this is simply whiskey that has been made using malted barley um, at one distillery, okay? A blended malt, the, 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 the makeup of a blended malt is actually the same as a single malt, except it's been made at two distilleries and then blended together, or maybe three distilleries or more. But the, but the important part is that it's still malt whiskey, okay? It's slightly confusing because obviously you've got three different types of blend there. Blended malt used to be called, until the late 90s, vatted malt or pure malt. Um, and although not ideal terms, at least they differentiated from blended scotch particularly. So now you know, there's, there's a little bit more room for confusion. When, as soon as people see the word blend on, a, on the label of whiskey, they, 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 make, uh, pre, they have a preconception about that whiskey. When actually, if it's a blended malt whiskey, uh, it contains exactly the same amount of malt as, uh, as a single malt. Um, single grain made in a slightly more modern fashion, as I was mentioning earlier. So this is the same type of operation that you would use to make the base spirit for gin or vodka, uh, basically using column or continuous stills to strip as much alcohol out of the grain as possible. And you would tend to use wheat or corn for those rather than malted barley. Um, you have to use a, an element of malted barley because it contains enzymes, which the other two grains don't contain, which essentially allows for fermentation. You wouldn't be able to get that reaction when you're adding yeast to it if, if you didn't have that. Uh, single grain whiskies, the most famous one you probably would recognize is the Beckham perfume bottle, otherwise known as Haig Club, um, which is a good kind of entry level whiskey to get people into whiskey. Um, but I would move them onwards and upwards uh, quite quickly from that. Blended grain whiskey, something you would very rarely see. Uh, there are only eight or nine grain distilleries in Scotland. Um, so single grain, you can get some really nice single grain whiskies. You don't see them that often. And likewise, blended grain is quite rare but it has to be there because it's a, a potential category and then finally blended scotch which is in terms of um, financials economics blended scotch is by far the most important category on that list uh, so it allows for the two top ones the single malt whiskey so single malt whiskey as an entity really only started to become a, any kind of marketing or economic importance at the late 60s, 1960s, uh, when Glenn Livick and Glenn Fiddick started to really get motoring. Prior to that, it was all about blended scotch. You know, blended scotch had a, a what, 70, 80 year head start on single malt whiskey. So the likes of Johnny Walker and Chivas Regal and Ballantines, Haig and so on, you know, these were all very well known before single malt whiskey started to become available. Um, and of course, blended scotch contains single malt whiskies anyway, and that's 
that's the main function of single malt or malt whiskey distilleries. That is their main function in life is to pro provide product for blenders. Most distilleries, single malt distilleries, give up 90% of their make to blenders. Okay. Um, there are some that pretty much all of their pro produce goes to blend. There are one or two exceptions. There are a few distilleries now, single malt distilleries, that have transcended this model. Um, the likes of Macallan, for example, very little of Macallan's single malt whiskey goes into blending anymore because as a single malt, it demands such a premium and is in such high demand around the world, they can get more bang for their buck selling it as a single malt rather than putting it into blending. Um, so there are a few exceptions to that. And frankly, blended scotch gets a bit of a bad rap, um, which is a real shame because to my mind it is at least as um, interesting and valid as single malt whiskey and can sometimes be, or quite often be, even more interesting simply because you've got a blend of various single malts plus the grain whiskey in there. The opportunity for um, a kaleidoscope of flavor is quite, is, quite, um, is quite dramatic. And I would certainly say to you, although we're tasting mainly well, all malt whiskey tonight, one of them is a blended malt, don't, don't diss the blend. You know, the blended Scotch whiskey has a lot to offer um, and certainly shouldn't be ignored. Okay. This we've covered in that last slide. So whiskey is made of barley, water, and yeast. It's a very simple product. It's something that, you know, if, if we all had uh, access to um, all of those ingredients at the same time, plus a will and a way and a couple of million pounds worth of distilling equipment, we could all do it. Um, it's, it's, it's the product of the field, essentially. It's a, it's a farming byproduct. And that's, that's, that's what draws a lot of people to it. You know, it's, it's easy to understand, generally speaking. So how do you make it? Well, we're going to go through that in a minute, but there's a simplification of it. You add barley, water and yeast together and age it for however long and you end up with a very nice bottle of whiskey. It's obviously slightly more intricate than that. <clears throat> Why don't we start on the next whiskey while we're talking about this? We can talk about Ockentoshan again a bit later on because we've got another Ockentoshan. I'm going to pour myself a wee dram of this uh, naked grouse. As you can see, it's got a highly evocative label or no label whatsoever. It's, it's just kind of, you can see the embossing of the grouse on the, on the glass there. It's naked, you see, no label, naked. I finally got that. Okay, so this to my mind is, is probably the best famous grouse product in the current lineup, I think. Um, it is a blended malt, so it doesn't contain any grain whiskey. That doesn't necessarily mean that's why it's good. Uh, it just happens to be good. And this is a blend of mainly Speyside single malts uh, from the uh, Edrington portfolio. So Edrington that owns... Uh, famous grouse, but they also own the likes of Highland Park and Macallan and so on. I'm told that there's a little bit of Macallan in there, but I, I believe if there is, it'll be a, a very small amount. The main reason that this whiskey is second in this lineup is that the Ockentoshan is a beautiful example of a, 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 a Scotch whiskey matured in ex-bourbon American oak casks. Um, this is a really nice example of what happens when you start to add a slightly different cask type in. So for this, there's quite a bit of whiskey in here that's been matured in uh, European ex-sherry casks. And straight away, I mean, you can see the color of it is that bit darker. I would almost describe that as a light amber color. And certainly when you stick your nose in it at full strength to begin with, straight away you should get more uh, kind of dried fruit and, and, and drier spices. And 
Mm. It's really quite clear. It's, like, it's almost like the um, the top of a apple crumble with sort of burnt demerara sugar or something like that. It's a really lovely sort of deep baked apple, sweet sugary nose on it. If you don't get what I'm saying in terms of tasting notes, don't worry about it. I'm just um, using my imagination, <laughs> my overused vocabulary. Um, if you like it, that's the main thing in all of in all of life. You know, it, it, if you can describe why you like it, then all the better. But sometimes we can't, and it, it doesn't make us any better or worse than the next person. Um, in fact, it makes life simpler sometimes if you if you know you like it, but you don't know why. Um, so don't worry if you don't pick up on on the flavors that I'm describing. Um, it's just to really help, you know, you build your vocabulary as well. So having smelled that at full strength, I like it. I like it. I'm going to add a little bit of water. little bit less water to this one. I tend to find that sherry casks and water don't tend to get along as quite as well as uh, um, whiskies that have been matured in um, uh, ex-bourbon casks. Um, and I must admit with whiskies from sherry casks at full strength, I love that intensity, you know, real kind of um i don't know what to how to describe it but there's there's something about them at full strength which is really appealing um whereas when you water them down slightly it tends to remove that but I'll do it anyway mm. just checking yeah so that's bottled, that's bottled at 40%. And I would definitely say, I mean, I've tasted a lot of whiskey in my time, as you can imagine. Um, and that tastes like a strong 40%. You know, I've tasted whiskies at a much higher ABV, which don't, take, don't have the, the same grip that shows you it's not necessarily about the alcohol. But I hope you like it anyway. Right, so in terms of production then, um we are just going to quickly run through this uh so the first stage of traditional malt whiskey production is is the malting if we take out the the, the, the farming side of, of things to begin with um now what you're seeing there is a very traditional way of malting the barley which isn't carried out at very many distilleries anymore you're talking two handfuls, well, one and a, one and a bit handfuls of, of distilleries. Um, I think seven or eight distilleries in Scotland out of 120 or so um, still carry out any kind of, any kind of malting. Um, but the way, the way to do it is essentially, you see the, the photo on the left, that's the steeps. So that's steeping barley in cold water for uh, seven to 10 days. Um, allowing the water to soak into the into the barley and then you spread it out onto the malt floor as in the middle um, and you can see chap they're spreading the barley now that's part of the reason they don't do much malting themselves anymore because it's extremely labor labor intensive it's not just about spreading the barley out but every day at least you've got to then turn the barley over because what's happening to that barley as it's lying there on the floor as it's germinating it's starting to grow and the rootlets are starting to appear from the barley and if it starts to get matted together it becomes very hard to to then process through the the mill so <clears throat> what you need to do is continually turn it to stop it from getting matted together and to also to allow um, equal amounts of, of air to reach the barley um, so on the right hand picture you see um the malt has fully matured if you like it's reached the, the the period of germination where it's time to shut it down otherwise you're going to end up with a new plant rather than being able to access the the um 
uh, the starch, which are going to convert into sugar and then alcohol. So if you don't shut it down in time, you're just not going to be able to do that. So you then take the barley, you put it on top of um, over a, uh, a furnace, essentially a fire. You see on the bottom left image is the, you can see the gauze, which the, the barley sits upon, which is above the fire to the right. The fire would be filled very traditionally with peat. These days, many distilleries have combination, so they would have one, uh, one peat fire and one anthracite fire um, because they don't want necessarily to get the, the barley too peated. So peat, which looks like this, would be shoved into that fire and burnt. And as that's being burnt, it, cre it creates the, a very thick smoke, which is redolent in phenols. There's the phenols that wrap the way around the barley and create that kind of smoky, eventually quite medicinal flavor in the, in the spirit. Now, in actuality, that happens at very few distilleries. Um, most distilleries in Scotland and around the world specify an unpeated barley. Um, so peated, peated barley and therefore peated whiskies are in the minority. We've got a couple in later on of um, varying levels, and we'll talk more about peat then. Okay. Now the milling, that's, that's generally at most distilleries where the process starts. So they will actually bring the barley in from an industrial maltings. Industrial maltings do the, the, the hard work in terms of malting the barley. They take it out of the hands of the distillers and allow them to get on with what they do best. Um, as I say, apart from a handful of distilleries. And the mill essentially grinds it down into what we call a grist. You can see that on the bottom left, which is the component parts of the barley all spread out. Deconstructed barley, if you like. Um, but it has to be to the right configuration. You have to have the right amount of flour, so the, the very inside, the sweet flour and the right amount of middles and the right amount of husks of the skin. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Because the next stage, what's gonna happen is you're gonna add lots of hot water to it. The hot water essentially explodes the, the, the sugar out of the barley. It's a very, very instantaneous reaction. Um, and if you don't have the right amount of middles, flour and husk, several things can happen. Too much flour, and it turns into a gelatinous mess. Too much husk and you don't get enough reaction. So it's, got, it's a very careful uh, grist recipe they have. And you can see on, so on the right hand side is the outside of these mash tons as they're called. And you can see also the uh, semi louds a ton on the, on the right hand side. You can see the, the kind of the arms that, that go round inside the mash ton to um, keep it from congealing if you like and on the bottom left you can see the water being added to it um, so three lots of water added to it the first at 63 and a half degrees c the next at around 80 and the final one at, at uh, 100 degrees each time it's getting hotter because each time they do it there's less sugar left so they, it needs to get hotter in order to extract as much of that sugar as possible Okay, and then fermentation, the making of beer, essentially. Um, these are wooden washbacks at Glenfiddich. Um, equally, you see stainless steel washbacks in the other distilleries. Um, there, there is a reason why people still use wooden washbacks and people prefer stainless steel. Stainless steel, basically because it's easy to clean. Um, wooden washbacks are kept because um, the distilleries that keep them feel that there is, or, or know that there is a, 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 almost like a secondary fermentation that occurs within the um, washback due to microflora bacteria from previous fermentations being embedded in the wood inside the washback. So this encourages a slightly fruitier beer, if you like, before we go into distillation. And we take the beer goes up, you know, you're taking it from zero ABV to around seven or eight percent ABV. And this occurs 
fermentation times vary quite wildly from as low as 36 hours in some distilleries up to over 100 hours in, in, in other distilleries. And um, a, lot of, a lot of people would say, particularly enthusiasts, would say they prefer a whiskey from a distillery which has a long fermentation time, which allows a, a steadier, longer period of building up fruity flavors from, from the fermentation. Um, but equally, you know, there's some very tasty whiskies from distilleries that don't have such a long fermentation time. So it's, it's, it's uh, tomatoes, tomatoes to a lot of people. So this is classic x-ray of a still, just so you can see, I really, I, I love this photo. It just shows you what's inside a still, how it works. And it's basically is a kettle. <laughs> It's got the, the coil in the bottom, which heats up the, the beer as it's pumped in. And the, um, the vapor lifts from the rest, from, from the liquid. Alcohol is a much lower boiling point than water, so it lifts off, take, goes up the, the, the swan neck, and is condensed into, back into liquid. And so distilleries tend, their stills work in pairs. Um, so you tend to have a wash still and a spirit still. Um, the wash still is where the beer goes into, goes through the distillation process. So vapor lifts off, goes in down the swan neck, as you can see there, hits the condensers. The condensers contain cold copper tubes um, or traditionally a worm tub, which might be stainless steel or copper and it's um, condensed into liquid at 25% alcohol, roughly speaking, around 25%. At this point, it's called low wines and is by far the most disgusting tasting part of the distillation process. If you go to a distillery, by all means, if you're offered, taste the wash, so the beer. Most often, if it's unpeated, it tastes kind of like Hogarden, if you remember that. Um, even the peated stuff is, is just about tolerable. But if they offer you any low wines to taste, just say thanks, but no thanks. They'll respect you for it and you'll be saving your palate at the same time. Okay, so we then take the low wines, put it through the spirit stills. Um, and what comes out of the spirit still, obviously exactly the same process, heating it up, the vapor rises. It's... Um, condensed and then um, collected. But by this point, we're talking about a liquid that contains somewhere between 65, 75% ABV. So it's really, the second distillation has done, the, done, the, done a lot of work to get it to there. And what you're looking at there is a spirit safe, which every distillery has. They all look slightly different, but they also serve the same purpose. Essentially what that allows the still man to do is select the middle cut. So as you can imagine, the first lot of spirit that comes off the spirit still is quite high in uh, fusel oils and, and, and heavy alcohol, you know, quite nasty stuff, which you wouldn't want to drink. So that stuff has to be funneled off into the faints receiver. By a combination of, you can see the hydrometers on the right hand, uh, left-hand side of that picture just about. Um, so a combination of looking at the alcohol level, so it will drop. So when it's at the, at the, the first part of the dis distillate will be at the very, very high level, you know, 72, 73% ABV. The still man will know when it gets to, say, 65%, maybe more, um, 66, 67%, each one will be slightly different, that that is where he wants to switch that over to the, the middle or the hearts of the spirit. That's the good stuff, the stuff that's going to eventually make it into cask. And so he will turn the taps at the top of the, of the spirit still and start collecting the, the, the pure spirit. And then again, he'll be monitoring the hydrometers quite closely. And as soon as it drops to a certain level, he'll switch it back again to the faints receiver um, because you don't want the latter half of the part of the distillate either because, again, not very nice flavors, but also not very nice components. Um, 
which probably wouldn't do you any good. So they get switched into the feints receiver. Fear not, because the product collected in the feints receiver is reserved and is added to the next batch of low wines to be redistilled in the spirit still. So it's, it's constantly recycled. There's nothing wasted in that respect. And there we go. There's <clears throat> a slightly more detailed slide showing the, the, the pot still and its workings. Again, like I say, if you'd like a copy of this um, to keep, I can provide that to you. Okay. Now, how are we getting on with the, the naked grouse? Are you enjoying that? It's just... Uh, okay, so the next part of the process and, and probably the most modern part of the process is putting the, the, the spirit into cask. And this, as I mentioned earlier on, this is a, this is a pretty recent development in terms of uh, relative to the, to the amount of time that has passed since, since whiskey or ushkava has been distilled for. Uh, so it's only you know, relatively recently that we've discovered that actually if you put it into a container um, that potentially contains something else, which didn't contain anything else, but if you put it in the right kind of container, actually what's going to come out of that is something much more interesting, much more drinkable. And that's where we are now. You know, we, the, the, the industry is constantly experimenting with ma mainly oak still, um, but also with other woods. I, I say experimenting, so you won't see Scotch whiskey that has been matured in anything other than the oak. You can, however, buy whiskies from other parts of the world which have been matured in other types of wood. And um, some of them are very interesting, some of them quite tasty, but they would tend to be finished in that, that type of wood rather than the full maturation in, in another style of wood. Oak, is, oak contains the right amount of uh, the right component parts to, to achieve the best maturation for whiskey. It's just been proven over the years. So it's strong, it's durable, flexible, but most importantly, it contains vanillins and lignins within the, within the um, uh, DNA of the wood itself, which is what provides whiskey with its flavor and also its color. Um, we don't know exactly where the color comes from in the oak, but it comes from somewhere in the oak. But certainly the flavor, we can point out certain elements of the particularly of oak, which provide desirable flavors in the whiskey. Um, now, the best kind of oak is American oak. And the reason for that is that it's, it's the strongest, it's the most tight grained, beautiful wood. Um, and what's even better about it from a Scotch whiskey distillery's point of view is that in America, in, in Kentucky, where they make obviously bourbon and rye, within their Scotch whiskey rules that we saw, or so not their Scotch, within their whiskey rules, um, if you compare them to the Scotch whiskey rules, in Scotland, you can use a cask made of oak, but beyond that, it's fairly flexible. You can use a brand new oak cask, you can use a second hand oak cask, use a third, fourth hand oak cask, it may have contained something else. Um, in the US, they have to use a brand new cask every single time. So the stipulation is a brand new American oak cask that's been heavily charred on the inside, and that's it. Once that distillery has matured its whiskey, it has to then dispose of that cask. Otherwise, any whiskey that goes into there cannot be called bourbon or rye or even single malt, American, American single malt, which you don't see a lot of at the moment, but you will see in the coming years, even that is, is covered by the same law. So American single malt or US single malt has to be matured in brand new oak, um, charred oak casks. Um, so yeah, um, 
But what that means is that there is then a surplus of casks, secondhand casks, very good quality secondhand casks, which are then you know, flood into the industry. Or that certainly that was the case. These days, there are so many Scottish distilleries, but also distilleries all around the world looking for casks that there, you know, there's not quite the same uh, wealth or flood of casks coming through anymore. There's a, there's a lot more um demand for them so it's not quite as easy to get hold of them anymore so you do see a lot of different different types of oak casks coming through now um <clears throat> okay so we reckon between somewhere anywhere between 60 and 80 percent of the final flavor of the whiskey comes from the cask therefore the cask is very important that's not to say that the other processes within the, the distillery are not important, and that, that would be an untruism. Um, it's very important to make good spirit because you don't want to put bad spirit in a good cask. It might taste okay, but it won't taste as good as good spirit put into a good cask. Okay, so that, that there is the bourbon barrel. Uh, it's 200 litres. It can be broken down and made into a 250 litre hogshead by adding additional staves. Um, although these days you see more barrels, I think, than hoggies at distilleries. What used to happen is they used to be broken down at the point of production. So after they've been used in, in America, they'd be broken down into, into stave form and then shipped over. But these days they are uh, more often than not shipped over whole. So you see a lot more 200 litre um, barrels. And you see the key flavors that we get from those would be vanilla, caramel, soft spice, coconut, the flavors that we saw in the Ockentoshan. I don't know why we've got that in there. And then we have a sherry butt. So that's, that's where the flavors for this whiskey are coming in. The more sort of dried fruits, dark chocolate, that kind of thing. I see a question. Hold on. Um, okay. When you say charred oak cask, what do you mean by charred? Okay. So essentially, it, it, it's it's flame grilled. So it's it's cut into its staves. It's it's shaped into a barrel using the the hoops, and the final stage of it, which provides as much as anything waterproofing. Um, is to char the inside of the cask. So it's as much to protect the cask. Well, certainly in the, in, you know, originally would have, the, the concept would have been to protect the cask. But what was latterly discovered is that there are lots of different char levels, if you like. So there's a, a light char all the way through to a very, very heavy char. And each would rely on slightly more time in, with the blowtorch, essentially. Um, a heavy char tends to provide, guess what, more kind of spicy flavors, more um, rich flavors. Um, so the char simply refers to the, so this is, this is a, a bit from a cask stave. And here you can see, so this is the char on the top. And if I, I mean, we've had this cask stave for years, but if I do that, I end up with, char on my finger so it's you know it's quite a um, vociferous element of the cask of the inside of the cask um, but yes yeah, so that's that's what charring means with a with a european oak sherry butt what you tend to see more of is toasting which is essentially similar to charring but using a more gentle process quite often using infrared just to give the the, the inside of, of the cask a very very light toasting yeah and this tends to mean that the so this this char level on this american oak stave will protect the wood obviously it's going to it's going to contribute flavor to the or assist contributing flavor to the to the american whiskey and then the scotch whiskey but at the same time it's protecting the wood from the from the from the liquid with um with a sherry cask be it European or American, really, 
if it's only toasted, it means that the, 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 the layer is slightly more permeable by the, by the wine that lies in that cask, meaning that the, the stave will actually absorb some of the liquid, maybe up to a quarter of an inch, so that when the Scotch whiskey then goes into that cask, there's the opportunity for it to actually reabsorb whatever was in that cask, in that layer which can have quite a uh, profound influence. I mean, I'm sure you've all tasted sherry and uh, port finished whiskies, and that's, that's, that's the general gist of those things. Anyway, I think, I feel like we should move on to the third whiskey. Christ, I've been going on for an hour. I hope you're not getting bored. <laughs> um, okay, so this third whiskey, uh, from Glen Geary, which is a uh, Highland distillery. I'm just going to find a slide with the... Okay, so there we can see. So you can see the Highlands, lots of distilleries and so many different styles at most of those distilleries. Glen Geary, if you look, if you can see Speyside and then look slightly to the southeast of Speyside, you see Glen, Glen Geary. It looks like Glen Geriach, but it's actually pronounced Glen Geary. Uh, I found this out years after I got to know it, probably much to the amusement of my whiskey drinking friends. Um, Glen Geary is lovely little distillery in the, a little village called Old Meldrum, uh, has been producing whiskey for you know, over 200 years. Um, 1797 it was founded and just one of those distilleries that you don't hear of it's not a big commercial distillery it doesn't make enough to be bothered to be commercial to be honest but it produces a, a lovely consistent uh, single malt and a very interesting single malt as well and part of the reason for the inclusion of this whiskey is it's so this is non-chill filtered at 48 percent abv now when i say non-chill filtered this whiskey has gone through or not gone through a particular process that most scotch whiskies have been which is chill filtering which is simply a method of removing fatty acids and lipids from the whiskey post maturation prior to bottling which stops the whiskey going cloudy if it's bottled at less than 46 percent abv so if you were to unchill if you were to not chill filter Ockentoshan that we tasted earlier and bottle at 40% 40, 40 alcohol, this, this would look like Hoe Garden. It would be cloudy. And obviously most people don't get cloudy whiskey. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Visually, it wouldn't work. Um, so they developed this chill filtering to remove the risk of this, this, this haze being thrown. Um, but what it means is you have to bottle, if you don't, if you don't want the haze, you've got to bottle it at more than 46% ABV. So this is bottled at 48%. Now, there is, there is obviously controversy as to whether chill filtering or, or not chill filtering is necessary. Um, I was doing a tasting the other day where there was a very, very renowned, iconic, uh, blender and distiller in the, in the group and I could see him shaking his head when I was talking about the benefits of non-chill filtration but um, it's fine I will I will talk to you about them anyway but essentially a lot of people feel that if you have a chill filtered whiskey versus a non-chill filtered whiskey that the non-chill filtered whiskey it won't taste any different to the chill filtered version but because you are leaving the kind of fatty acids and lipids within the liquid, it, it's more viscous. It's got a slightly more oily, maybe velvety mouthfeel. So obviously you can't compare this to a non-chill filtered ver or a chill filtered version, but you have just tasted two whiskies that are chill filtered. So when you're, when you're tasting this, as well as the flavors, compare, try and compare the mouthfeel and how it feels when it leaves your throat, or how it goes down your throat. Um, I'd be interested to see if you, th find it any different. The other thing with this whiskey is that I find 
of all the whiskies tonight, this is the one that needs the most water. Um, I tend to add around 50-50 to this one. Um, it's just, it's, it's purely personal taste. There's a, there's a flavor in there, which I think doesn't quite work until you get to 50-50 water, but that's up to you to find out for yourself as well. But I'd certainly be interested to see if anyone picks up on the, the fact that you should get a little bit more, um, like I say, viscosity, mouthfeel. But again, it's got a lovely kind of stewed, stewed fruits and spiciness, a little bit of pepper as well. Maybe a slight meaty, meaty nose um, aroma as well. They, they do make some really good whiskies there. So well worth, I'll show you the bottle. Glen Geary, so single Highland malt whiskey. And this is the Founders Reserve. Are we getting on with that? You enjoying that? <laughs> I will unmute you eventually. Once I'm finished talking, you can talk as much as you like. Okay, so let's go on to. I'm going to go back to Ockentoshen, and this is the Three Wood Ockentoshen. It's a lovely sound, isn't it? Um, now, part of the reason for including this whiskey in here is a lot of people will taste whiskies from a certain distillery and they might say well you know what? I don't like I didn't like that so I don't like that distillery and that 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 for some reason that really bugs me because I suppose partly because I am I know that every distillery produces a different type of whiskey or a different bottling um, and maybe maybe a dozen maybe two dozen different bottlings that all taste slightly different if not dramatically different so I always encourage people who say, oh, I'm not, not a big fan of so-and-so distillery to, to, to go back and, and try something else because I'm pretty sure you'll find a bottling of theirs that you will like, um, except in very rare cases. So for this, this Ockentoshen is completely different. I mean, if I hold the two bottles up, you can see the, the um, I mean, the color is, is the first clue. So the American oak, as it sounds, matured in American oak, ex-bourbon. The three wood starts its life in ex-bourbon American oak, but then is swapped into casks that previously held Oloroso sherry, um, European oak casks, and then finally into casks that previously held Pedro Jimenez, um, who wasn't a winger for uh, Tottenham Hotspur or anything like that, but he was—he wasn't anything. Um, Pedro Jimenez is a very sticky, sweet, um, fortified sherry. It's—it's—it's it's, it's almost undrinkably sweet. It's something that you like maple syrup that you pour over your ice cream. It's just so thick and syrupy, uh, and obviously that's going to have a. a um, a significant effect on the whiskey as well. So when you smell this one, as I'm about to do, and this one's bottled at 43%, so slightly stronger than the um, American oak, but certainly not enough to do any damage. And yeah, we talked about in the naked grouse, this slightly dried fruit spiciness. This, this is like that, but t times a magnitude of a hundred or so. You get a real, real hit of kind of seasonal flavors like Christmas pudding and brandy butter and all those kind of lovely things. 
know, there's a lot of people who absolutely love sherry cask whiskies and if they could, would drink nothing else. Um, equally, there's some people who really don't like it and both is fine. You know, it's, it's entirely up to, up to each, each person to, to have their opinion. Now, what I would say is that this is what I would call an old fashioned kind of single malt whiskey because going back decades when sherry was far more popular, um, there was many more ex sherry casks available to distillers to use and far fewer, if any, ex bourbon. Um, sherry and wine casks were by far the uh, default option for Scotch distillers. Um, and it was only post prohibition in the, in the United States where we started to see this influx of American oak casks. And so that coupled to the fact that sherry has become, unfortunately, uh, over the years, it's fashionability, if you like, has dwindled, even though it's a very fascinating drink itself and is definitely deserving of, of, of anyone who's interested in alcoholic beverages attention. Um, but because of its, it's, it's fall in, of fallen grace, if you like, fall from grace, um, you just don't see as many whiskies matured in sherry casks. It's, it's a very, very simple equation. If you like sherry cask, cask whiskies, do your bit, drink more sherry. That's uh, the message I always I always um, say to people about these, um, because it is you know I love sherry cask whiskies, I love bourbon cask whiskies, I like all good whiskey. If I'm in the mood for it though, a good sherry cask whiskey is 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 hard to beat, it really is, it really is. But hopefully you like that too. But I mean, in terms of in terms of value, I think that's outstanding. I, th I don't know. I, th I think it's less than fifty quid. There are not very many single malt whiskies with that level of of um, sherry flavour, which you can get for for less than that. So it's, a, it's if you like that, it's a really it's a good one to go for. There are others, obviously. obviously. Glen Farkless in Speyside, um, family owned, family run, make some incredible sherry cask whiskies. Macallan traditionally, um, Mortlach, uh, Glendronach. There's, 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 there's a few that specialize in, in, in sherry casks and well worth, well worth seeking out. In fact, one of them we're gonna taste just um, in a second, uh, which is the Highland Park, uh, Quite different to Ockentoshan, obviously, but well, maybe not obviously, but they tend to use mainly ex sherry casks. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let's just see where we are on these slides, see if there's anything. That was Space Side. That's the River Spay. That's a sherry butt. So there you see the, the, the kind of um, compar comparison of advantages of using the, the, the two different cask types. Um, <clears throat> so obviously we've tasted the Glen Geary, which is a Highland single malt, and the Naked Grouse, which is a combination of Speyside and Highland single malts, and the Ockentush, which is a Lowland malt. So Highland Park, you can see on the map there, is up in the Orkney Islands. It was um, previously the, the, the most northerly distillery in Scotland. Um, and another very historic distillery. So I think three of the, five, three of the six whiskies tonight, the, the single, the distilleries predate the um, the dawn of the 19th century. So the uh, Highland Park dates back to the um, late 1700s, like um, Glen Geary and then Bamore. Um, and I'd have to say Highland Park in previous years for sure has been one of my sort of go-tos. It's 
it's what we call a uh, it's a peated whiskey but it's a it's a light to medium peated whiskey and wh what i mean by that is that the barley has been peated to a, to a fairly low level um, and then mixed with unmalted barley before then being processed for, for distillation purposes. So that's the Highland Park. So this is 12 year old Highland Park. So this is a standard flagship Highland Park, if you like. Um, I've been tasting this a few times over the last few weeks and, and really, really enjoying it. Um, I think it's, I think actually this and the Bamore we're going to taste next are two of the best standard bottlings you can get. Simple as, you, know, you don't need to spend more, really, the, 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 that good. Um, and for me, what I like about Highland Park and other medium peated whiskies like Springbank in Campbelltown and one or two others is that the, the, the smokiness of this, you can detect but it doesn't it's not everything it's not the only thing within that whiskey's dna it's 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 there to balance the sweetness in the rest of the in the rest of the the, the um, flavor profile and that for me is what pete is there for so you can maybe hear the cat flap damn cat are you coming in or are you going out what are you doing uh <clears throat> so when you stick your nose in that it's it's almost like you can you're smelling like a beach barbecue from a distance or something it's a it's a it's a really soft smoky smell the other thing you have to bear in mind is that there are different kinds or varieties of peat so um on 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 um orkney hobbiston hobbiston moor where highland park get their peat from uh is much more in the way of 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 decomposed heather and flora whereas on either it's more about sphagnum moss so you know much more in the way of well, what ends up as sort of more seaweedy flavors um, because of the seaweed moss that um is is going into it um so the 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 peat on on orkney certainly near to highland park is seen as a slightly softer peat if you like in terms of its flavor profile um doesn't wouldn't ever give necessarily a medicinal flavor, even if it was peated more highly. So what Highland Park do, Highland Park is one of the only distilleries that does malt its own barley. It's only a small amount. It doesn't malt all of its own barley because it's, it's just no chance because it produces too much whiskey. So it peats all of its own barley and then it mixes that peated barley with mainland barley that comes in, um, it's imported in and then that's crushed down together and you end up with something that is slightly peated rather than heavily peated. Um, whereas if you go, if you look at the distilleries from Isla, they will tend to use uh, all peated mal malted barley, um, whether it be from their own source or whether it's bought in, but all of that barley would have been peated. Whereas with Highland Park, it's a mix of unpeated with peated barley. And I think it, it, it really works well. I have to say that um, that definitely does it for me. That everyone goes through their phases of their favorite things, maybe their favorite whiskeys, favorite wines or whatever. Um, I find medium peated whiskeys at the moment are the, the, the ones that do it for me. I don't like it to be too sweet. I don't like it to be too peated. I like it to have a balance of the two and that really works well. Um, I'm going to try a tiny bit of water. But at this point, it's up to you. I'm not going to tell you to add water if you don't want to. Mm. Pretty good. Okay. Now, so we've, we've tasted, kind of introduced you to peat if you haven't tried it, a peated whiskey before. And now we're going to take you to a slightly higher level of peating. Don't be afraid. Once again, 
when we when we were putting this tasting together, it would be very easy to put a Lefroy or an Ardberg or something like that on the very end. Um, but you know, for a lot of palates, that would just uh, put them off. You know, it would be some people would really like it, but then there'd be I'm sure a few people would say, "Oh no, that's that's not what I'm about at all." So we decided on 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 the Bamor, um, and Bamor is apart from being a lovely whiskey, is the, so the more itself is the capital of Isla. Let me just see if I can find the, uh, there's, there's Pete. Uh, females. There you can see Isla, okay. And you can see um, sort of middle of the island or middle, middle left, uh, but more. And Bamor is, as I say, is the capital of Isla. The distillery is very much a part of the community. It employs a number of people from the community. Uh, there is also a leisure center with a swimming pool, literally not quite adjoining the distillery, but adjoining enough that the excess heat from the distillation process is used to heat the swimming pool. And Bamor, um, at least part funded, if not funded the entire leisure centre themselves. Um, so it's a very important part of the community. And, and Isla itself is is just a, an incredible community. Uh, you, I go there at least once a year, obviously not this year, um, or maybe hopefully towards the back end of the year maybe, um, almost to recharge my batteries, <laughs> both whiskey and otherwise, because it's just such a wonderful place so, I mean, it's a beautiful place, as as most of the Hebridean islands are, but, um, yeah, the people plus the whiskey plus the place equals just a very, very special um, place to visit. And I would certainly recommend, if you've never been there, to go. Um, the, the, very, the distilleries nowadays are so well set up for, for visitors. Um, each of those distilleries on there, you can you can go and see and... and do tours and taste and all that kind of thing. Um, you could you can you can bike around it. You don't even have to drive, or you, or you know if if, you, if you've got the funds, get someone to drive you around. You know, even better. Um, but but more, you can see it sits in the middle. It almost sits in the middle in terms of its peating as well. So famously or not, Bunahav and Bruchladi would be the unpeated single isla malts. So if you were looking for an alternative to mainland malt, not peated, than Bunahav and Brookladi, even though both also produce peated variants, but they would generally be advertised as being peated. And then you move up from there to the likes of Bamor, um, kind of Kalila, I would say, if you want a slightly more medium peated single malt. And then you move up to the likes of Lefroy, Lagavulin, and Ardbeg, Kilhoman, if you want to be slapped around the face with a hearty, peaty fist, um, which I do occasionally, I must admit. Uh, I, I love I love peated whiskies. Winter months is where they come into their own, to be honest. Um, but they are a force of nature, really. Really, really lovely stuff. Um, but with the Bamor, like I say, this is, so this is medium peated. So... When we say light, medium, heavily peated, how how is that quantified? Well, it's quantified by measuring the phenol parts per million in the barley prior to it then being processed for fermentation and distillation. Um, how do you make a whiskey peated or more peated? You simply leave it over the peat fire for longer. You just allow the phenols to be absorbed by the damp barley for a longer period of time and you'll end up with a, a higher level of phenols in the in the barley now during the distillation process all the way through from uh, mashing fermentation uh, distillation maturation the barley will lose the phenols the phenols will start to fade so for example something like ardbeg which is the phenol content in the barley itself before any um, distillation rigmarole is around 56.5 phenol parts per million but by the time it goes through all of that it's around 17 
phenol parts per million. So it does lose quite a lot through the process. So you have to start high in order to get the requisite levels uh, that you want at the, the, at the bottling level. But more is petered to around, from memory, around 20, uh, maybe 25 phenol parts per million. Um, so quite a lot lower. And what that means, again, compared to the Highland Park, you will certainly get a little bit more smoke from it. But for me, Bamore is was all about tropical fruits. So what you should get, apart from any smokiness, is a real kind of hit of um, things like peaches and pineapples and uh, passion fruit. Call me crazy, but that's what I get. Now, if we maybe add a little bit of water to that. Now, the risk here is that water tends to, with peated whiskey, it tends to emphasize the smokier flavors, which isn't necessarily a bad thing if you like, if you like that. But let's see what it does to the fruitier flavors. It kind of brings them together, actually, I think. So I get... I get smoky peaches and smoky um, pineapples. Really rather attractive. Mm. So in common with the Glengarry and, and Highland Park, this, this predates the 19th century, 1779. It's the oldest distillery on the island. Um, and as I say, produces a very, very lovely liquid. It also malts a proportion of its own barley, uh, similarly to Highland Park. Um, and, and again, it's only, it's only a proportion. Most distilleries that malt some of their own barley do it almost to preserve that, that, um, that skill, you know, because there are so few distilleries doing it nowadays, it's, it's almost in fear of dying out. Um, so it's important that, that distilleries do still do it where they can. And I know that there are new distilleries which are doing it. And there's even historic distilleries that stopped doing it years and years ago who are considering restarting it um, because, oh, for whatever reason, um, which is great. You know, I mean, whiskey is going through a beautifully purple patch at the moment. Well, not, obviously not, not at the moment, but prior to, to the year 2020, um, in which there are more distilleries than ever before, making more whiskey than ever before. So our, you know, the choices we now have as consumers is, is, is amazing, almost bewildering. So we, we are in a very, very um, good time for not just Scotch whiskey, but for whiskies from all around the world. I mean, I could talk to you all night about Japanese whiskies, Taiwanese whiskies, Indian whiskey, Australian whiskey and so on, because there's just so much good whiskey being made everywhere. So you find yourself at a very good time to get into whiskey if, if that's what you're doing. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the brave move of unmuting you all. And we can have a little chat. Yorkshire whiskey, well. do you know about that? You know, it's, it's not just a great time for Scotch whiskey and whiskies from around the world, but for English whiskey. You know, you know we had a London distillery, Bimber. We had the Cotswolds, mm -hmm. we had the Lakes, Spirit of Yorkshire. and um, Eddie, yeah. may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, the sherry butts or casks that they use, mm -hmm. surely if they're used, the more they use, the flavour decreases its influence over the flavor decreases or mm -hmm. are they only used once it's a very good question um it varies from distillery to distillery but uh, part of the reason that you see a lot of finishing I say finishing so the process of taking whiskey that's previously been matured in ex bourbon casks say for 10 years and then putting it into a sherry cask for maybe six months, maybe nine months, maybe 12 months, rather than using that cask for a full cycle of maturation, almost preserves that cask for times to come. So um, 
that cask could then be used two or three times at least rather than if you use that sherry cask for one 10 year cycle or 12 year cycle whatever it might be it might need to then go and be re-seasoned which it, mm. which it quite possibly could be so it could be uh in the same way that a, a bourbon cask is re decharred and recharred you could do the you, and they do the same thing to a sherry cask maybe re-toast it and re-season it with sherry yeah, i rarely add wh water to whiskey anyway mm. yeah well, again that's another personal thing i would yeah. never say that's right or wrong no quite um i mean I, I said earlier on i tend to add water to whiskey only when i'm analyzing when i'm trying to really pull apart the the, the aromas it, it, it just helps it's like mm -hmm. it's like sketching rather than painting yeah, they... thank you very much guys take care of yourselves and uh, and your families and friends and hopefully see you again sometime cheers now bye yeah, thank care. you eddie really enjoyed it it's been uh, enlightening learned a lot good i'm glad to hear that good night everyone thank you